So welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Corman and I have the privilege of being the Executive Director of the UIC Alumni Association. Welcome to the UIC Alumni Exchange Series. Each week we work to bring you a variety of programs and topics so you can explore, connect, and even escape from the everyday with a community of UIC alumni, staff, and faculty experts. You'll hear me say this a few times today, but I encourage you to visit go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange for the latest and greatest programming. And with that, I'm excited to start our program this afternoon. We are grateful to our colleagues in the College of Engineering and to the Engineering Alumni Advocates Board for their partnership in bringing this program to you today. I am honored to welcome UIC alumna and bioengineering professor Hanana Ismaybegi, who will talk, who will talk us through what wearable technology is and what we may see in the future as she presents a new frontier in wearable technology. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Professor. I'll turn it over to you to begin the program. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Hanana Snowbegi. I'm a professor in the Department of Bioengineering at UIC. Um, and today I'm here to talk to you about wearable technology in general, where they have been and where we are at the current moment. And then I'm gonna introduce you to the work that we do in this area. Just to give you a little background about why I'm giving this talk and where I come from. I did my undergrad in Tehran Polytechnic in Iran, both in electrical and biomedical engineering. And then I actually moved to UIC and worked with Dr. Patrick Brosha to get my PhD. Part of my PhD was done in Germany, Intech Institute. And after my PhD, I actually went to Howard Hughes Medical Institute in DC and uh, basically did my postdoc there and then continued working there as an engineer. Um, all of that work was focused on developing and designing brain implants, essentially implants that we can implant into the, into the brain, electronics that we can implant into the brain in order to understand the brain functionality and also to use that understanding to extract signals for controlling uh, smart prosthetic. So imagining someone has lost their ability to control their arm because they have actually lost their arm or lower limb or their hearing or vision as a result of um, an illness. Uh, basically, how do we design these implants to be able to help them regain back that ability? Uh, but as much as interesting that work is and was always to me, I'm the type of patient who would like to see the effect of their work come to life much faster in their lifetime possibly. And you can imagine when you're working with your brain and you, you have FDA involved, there's a lot of complication in that area, especially within the research world. So when I used, uh, when I moved back to UIC and, and wanted to start my own research lab, I wanted to leverage that technology and apply it to wearable tech where they're essentially still interacting with your body, but not necessarily your brain. So you can actually develop, um, develop assistive devices or augmentative devices that you can see the effect of them on someone's life and uh, basically hopefully making a positive impact faster. Um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna walk us through the history of variable tech to start with. So I have a question for you. What do you think was the first and the oldest wearable technology out there? Write it in the chat if you have a guess. The first one and the oldest one. Let me pull up chat. I see interesting ones coming up, uh, but um, I saw a couple of people mention eyeglasses, and that's true. Eyeglasses developed in 1286 in actually beautiful Italy in Pisa, who are the first type of wearable tech that existed out there. And as you can imagine, they haven't really changed that much. 
and they are most widely used these days. But since that point in time, we've had interesting wearable tech, like an interesting watch that you could carry around with you or a ring that you could calculate, you could use to, you know, calculate math with, or one of my favorite ones, these uh, cameras that were attached to pigeons during World War I to study the enemy line. Uh, and you know, get information about it. Uh, so the progression continues and we get closer to what we see these days, these wristbands that you could use as calculators. And then we all, I'm sure we all remember Walkmans and how they revolutionized essentially music for us, personal music for us. And then I remember these watches where you could actually play games with them. The initial actually, when initially they came out, they were kind of like Apple Watch. They were about $2,000. So only the uh, elite could afford them. Uh, and the, you know, and the rest is history. They keep developing. And for example, here we have Steve Mann and his research on wearable computer. And you can see the progression from 1980s to the late 90s how basically he started with bigger electronics and things got a smaller and a smaller and this actually led to the development of google glass and i like this timeline because it sort of resembles the timeline that we see actually for cell phones out there uh, so it has started like we all remember it started with cell phones right and initially only few adapters that are generally um, willing to spend a lot of money on technology started adapting it. But then it sort of became a ne necessity and pretty much everyone has it. Now 81% of the population globally has access to smartphones and uh, to, to smartphones. And that's, that's the interesting part. We transitioned at some point from regular cell phones to smartphones and the competition started rising. And various different companies, various different tech out there started investing in developing technology for smartphones. So as a result of that, we started having miniaturized sensors being developed and electronics got a smaller and smaller. And then we started seeing internet, internet of things happening. Then we started storing a lot of data that we were gathering from these cell phones into the cloud. And then we started developing algorithms like AI and big data in order to interact with these information. And at the same time, we were seeing advances in nanotechnology the, uh, and you know, microtechnology leading to development of finer, finer and smaller and less intrusive sensors. And it's about with this progression that the wearable tech company was able, a wearable tech technology out there was able to adapt this sensor and this electronic technology and um, develop basically smart wearables that we can put uh, either on our body or around us, mirables in that sense, and quantify pretty much every aspect of our life from that point on. So if you want to really think about categories of wearable, um, wearables that exist out there, we can think about the most prominent one that we're mostly familiar with are the physical activity and fitness trackers out there. So they started really with about a decade ago with habit forming wristbands. So this wristband job when I started developing them was one of the first one. Uh, they would alert you if you're sitting for too long, it will give you a buzz and you would be like, okay, I now need to get up. So they would make you slightly more active and as a result, make you live a slightly healthier life. But then we, we were looking for more. So basically three different categories of wearables started being developed. Uh, the very first and basic ones essentially used motion sensors like accelerometers or gyroscopes in order to track your, track your step, track when you're moving, right? Uh, so they would give you a quantification of how many steps you've taken throughout the day. And then that's when we all started hearing that you need to at least walk 10,000 steps a day 
which I don't know how it's happening these days being stuck at home. Um, and then we have the next generation that has started using optical sensing. There are these sensors called PPG that essentially what they do is that they basically optically look at your blood flow and from that extract your heartbeat. And uh, for example, this Garmin watch down here, as well as your heartbeat, it can also extract your breathing rate from similar algorithms. And they have different fitness modes like for, um, rowing or biking or skiing, essentially based on um, at the accelerometers that exist in, in these type of watches and their algorithms, they can extract what sort of fitness mode you're in and based on that estimate, for example, the amount of calorie um, that you have burnt during that fitness mode. And then uh, only a couple of years ago, uh, we started putting ECG sensors, electrocardiogram sensors uh, in these variables. And essentially what ECG sensors do is that they just don't give you one number and tell you this is your heart rate. They actually record your heart signal, your ECG signal, the electrical activity of your heart and report that to you. So if somebody has a pre-existing condition, they can look at their ECG or they can share that with their doctor and have a better understanding of what is happening throughout the 24 hours. And, and these days, these um, sensors are just so popular and so tiny and small and easy to use. I mean, I saw a couple of students here in my wearable tech class, we even like use these PPG sensors in lab one for students to develop like a smart tracking watch. So they're, they're so common now that soon we're gonna see them everywhere in any tag that we buy. And it should be very easy. So as well as wristbands, so wristbands make essentially about 50% of the wearable tech market. But it's not just wristbands. Well, we remember these ads that we saw about Nike a couple of years ago. I remember I was, I really liked it at that point that you could put sensors in your shoes and track your run. Not that I run, but it was interesting. And um, even fitness clothing that can essentially give you feedback about your breathing rate, about your heart rate, even about your alignment, they exist out there. And one thing that I am really passionate about is that when we are actually talking about fitness and health, it's not just about physical health, it's actually about mental health as well. And it's only over the past, I would say three, four years that we, we are starting to see variables that are trying to address your concentration or your mode during meditation. Um, and they're, they're trying to provide the user uh, feedback about how they're actually relaxing. So I like seeing those and they're essentially extracting, extracting brain signals in order to do that, but from the surface of the brain. Um, another category of variables is, is, is essentially variables used for he, um, entertainment and human augmentation. So think of things like Google Glass, a Snapchat Glass, or a lot of VR headsets that we see out there. Uh, they're actually being applied to healthcare application, for example, for rehabilitation using VR headsets is actually a common practice these days. But they started with entertainment, and those are always the best when you try to market the general public, and as a result of that, lower the cost of production, and then you can actually use it in healthcare application, which brings down the cost a lot. Uh, one of my favorite human augmented devices that is still not in the market, but they're basically gaining certifications for it, and they claim that it will be available soon is the Mojo Lens. Essentially, uh, here you can see a size of a ladybug, and then you can see the size of the display of the Mojo Lens. So it's this little, this is a prototype. It's supposed to be clear once it becomes available in the, in the market. So it's this lens that when you put it on without obstructing your field of view, it can give you information about what you're looking at. Or for example, if you're biking, it could give you direction about which lane you should go. Uh, so it would be very interesting to see how they actually 
impact our life because Google Glass was pretty much designed to do the same thing, but it wasn't that successful to begin with. So it's interesting to see the adaptation of these devices. Another very interesting one for me is this um, Hawk shirt developed by Cute Circuit, a company based in London. And essentially what it does is that it believes the same way that we pick up our phone and give someone a call or send someone a text and check up on them, we should be able to send digital hugs. Uh, so there are actuators inside this shirt that when you send someone a digital hug, it interacts with the app and actually mimics the sensation of giving someone a hug. They were actually featured in a couple of big magazines and won a couple of awards for this. And this is back in 2006. But with the way 2020 is going and with the hands-free feature of our award, maybe this is going to be the future of our hugs for a while at least, right? So it's interesting to think about that. And in general, it's interesting to think about that for years, for decades, I mean, centuries, we've been using clothing as a way of communicating our beliefs and our emotions and as a way of expressing ourselves. Oh, you got muted by accident. All right. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, we, we used a clothing as a way of expressing our emotions and our beliefs. And there is no reason we should have stopped now. So this company Reconnect is actually developing these garments that uh, they can read one's emotions from their vitals, from the you know, your temperature, your heart rate and whatnot. And, and it's not just about the hardware. There's usually a lot of software and algorithms that goes into extracting emotion, right? So as a result of that, they can display one's emotion. And this is done in collaboration with NASA because when astronauts are in the International uh, Space Station, for example, they can communicate with, coming from various different backgrounds, various different cultural manners and ways of expressing emotions. They can use this to communicate emotion or if somebody is in trouble, they can use this uh, to essentially convey what that person is going through. So I think these are very fascinating work that is that hopefully we'll see them in our future. But I wanna ask you this, out of all these variables that we just discussed, how many of you uh, have anything that is similar to this? Maybe we can pull up the pool and see if you have anything that is similar to this. Just want to have an understanding of how many of us use variable tech. Interesting. So about 73% of us have a variable tech out there. All right. So on to the next question. I wanna know how many of you actually use that device on a regular basis? Um, this is the old question. Um, Do we have the second question? Yep, sorry about that. I think they're just switching. Okay. Right now. okay, there we go. Now, uh, answer if you use it in a regular basis. Yes, you do use it consistently, sometimes, not really. That's interesting, right? About half and half, half of us uh, use it consistently and half of us use it sometimes or really don't. And that's the interesting thing about wearable tech. The rate of abandonment is quite high. I personally have, three, have bought three Fitbits that I don't even know where they are at this point and wore them maybe a month. Uh, also, the rate of returning device, these devices are actually pretty high too. About 20% of the wearables being purchased are returned. But that's, uh, 
that's in contradiction with cell phones, for example, if you remember I mentioned when it became a necessity, then we started adapting it. And now 81% have it and we at all times we know where our cell phones are, right? Um, and we have to check them all the time, right? So if you have a need in order to use wearables, then you're gonna actually continuously, continuously use it. If, uh, and the need existed before 2020 for variable assistive devices, right? So let's talk about that. But there's a new category of them that we're gonna actually be using from now on. So let me get there. Uh, so assist, assistive devices. So imagine this is an example where uh, Messi is endorsing it. So it has to be good, right? So there's this camera that you can attach to your eyeglasses uh, for visually impaired individuals. And essentially it zooms into the text and it, discreet, it discreetly reads it for the user. So it's a uh, quiet way of interacting with it. And one thing that you, we have to mention about assistive devices is that the less the less intrusive they are, the less they attract, they attract unwanted attention, the higher the rate of adaptation of these devices. That's another problem we have in the assistive device board. If it's attracting unwanted attention, then we don't wanna use it. We are the same way, right? If there's something that we need, but everyone else is gonna think that we actually need them, we're not comfortable using them. So making them discreet is actually extremely important. Uh, and there are various different texts out there. For example, exoskeleton devices that we can wear for someone who has lost their ability to control their lower limb or needs assistance with that, or smart prosthetics for someone who has lost a limb as a result of it. There's also brain computer interface devices out there. And for example, Facebook, um, is developing an optical imaging headset uh, for being able to decode a speech quietly. Actually, a UIC alumni, Emily Muggler from my lab, works uh, from my old research lab, works in this uh, project. So it's interesting to see what's being done out there. Um, so remember the hug shirt I told you about? They also have another version of it called the sound shirt that they have incorporated more sensors in there. So for a visually, uh, for a hearing impaired individual, when they go to a concert or when they go to a music club, it uh, translates music into sensation on their t-shirt. So it's actually very interesting to see these two individuals. There's a video about it. who we'll actually use these to hear the music and the sensation and the you know, satisfaction that you see in their face is pretty stunning. So that's one set of assist, uh, wearable devices that are essentially assistive devices. And because of the need, they're adapted at much higher rate. But now as able body individuals, we are moving to a frontier that we, we're gonna have wearable tech available to us that can do early detection of disease or provide personalized health healthcare or, or they're essentially point of care devices. So for example, look at this uh, wristwatch. When you wanna get information about your blood, there's really no way of getting that except interacting with the blood. So they have these nano sensors. Uh, it's not currently available in the market, but there are publications about, that, about it. They have these nano sensors that painlessly pierce into the skin, interact with, uh, with the blood and essentially read the glucose level available in the blood. There's also lenses that Google has worked on and we see a couple of newer company um, claiming that they're gonna be available in the market in a couple of, a couple of years that they actually do glucose monitoring from tear. Uh, we also see that, for example, the first pancreas a couple of years ago uh, got FDA approval. So that was an uh, exciting era. And we also see these patches that you can attach your skin, they're smart patches. They can uh, monitor glucose level. Or for example, this is one of my favorite ones. 
that I'm thinking of getting for sure. Uh, this this addresses motion sickness. So it um, you've seen wristbands out there that put pressure on a point in the body in, in order to address uh, motion sickness or nausea. But this one actually electrically stimulates that point in the body and it has FDA clearance and the reviews are quite high for it. So it's interesting to see wearables that are actually addressing problems in healthcare. There's a lot of interesting, very interesting research being done in flexible electronics and miniature sensor where you can actually put a band-aid band like tag on your skin. It can record your ECG signal or for example, your heart rate signal or for example, interact with your sweat and extract information from it about your health, about your health and your current state of health. Well, one of the most interesting one that I knew about for the longest time, but the market for this just went crazy this year. And it was adapted in huge studies by uh, essentially medical professionals are all pretty much wearing it now. There are these aura rings. Essentially what they have is that they have the PPG sensors that we talked about that can ex essentially extract your heart rate and they have temperature sensors in there and they have the traditional accelerometers and they use this to constantly monitor the frontline work workers and healthcare professionals in order to see if you know how the COVID and this pandemic is actually affecting the frontline workers. So there, there is a lot of studies. If you look them up, you see it across the country at, the, at even different countries um, that these rings are being used. And one very interesting thing is that in Finland, out of all the countries, variable texts are adapted very fast. So that's just a random point. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, over the past couple of months, we have started seeing in the news, I'm sure you've seen something like this, that your Apple Watch or Fitbit or your Aura Ring could know that if you have essentially uh, contracted COVID before you actually become sick. And the way they actually do that is they look at your heart rate and the variation from the normal range that you have. And they claim, uh, there's a studies out there that claims three days before one actually becomes sick and starts showing any signs, we can actually tell that they have COVID. And that's very interesting, right? Then you can start uh, you know, isolating yourself and limit the spread of the disease, right? And the beauty of these variables is that you get basically information in a live manner and you get uh, geographically accurate information. So for example, hopefully that's not the case, but we see in Chicago, there's a huge spike, right? And we're like, okay, we gotta do something about Chicago before CDC or the government or the officials start realizing what is happening and start taking actions, right? So with that in mind, it's important to mention that the market in 2019 for wearable tech was about $33 billion and it was projected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of about 16% up to 2027. And the idea was that this projection was based on the fact that people will start adapting them for monitor, monitoring chronic disease. And as the rate of obesity is increasing, people will actually wanna you know, help address that. And professional athletics, there's a whole field about that, about how professional athletics actually use wearable tech. Those are gonna contribute to their adaptation. But by far, nobody really saw this year and the pandemic coming and the effect that it has had on us wanting to constantly be able to know what, it, what are our vitals? We can't even swipe into a building at UIC without telling them, hey, this is my temperature today, right? But imagine if we had a variable that could easily sync with the system and provide that information to us and then we could release it. I know there's issues of privacy out there. I'm not the one to really discuss that. Um, but um, apart from privacy issue, then it will make everything else a lot easier, right? So point being that the adaptation rate of variables is gonna be increased as a result of this bizarre year that we were in. 
But another important factor that I want to talk to you about and use it as a gateway to talk about my current research that we're doing is the fact that this pandemic didn't just affect our health in a physical aspect, right? Our world in March transitioned into a two-dimensional space, right? We all started talking to each other like this. That's why we're meeting. Uh, instead of having a nice interactive workshop, we're doing this talk virtually today, right? Um, and the effect that this uh, separation from the society and interaction with 2D uh, dimensions had on our mental health is actually significant. And we all, you can, you all remember, we started using Zoom in order to have, you know, happy hours with our friends, with our coworkers, and and started using ways of adapting to our current situation, right? But imagine somebody who doesn't have the ability to use their arm to swipe on the keypad, keypad or on the mouse in order to connect with the computer, right? In order to read that information. Uh, the emotional burden of that is actually significant. The emotional burden that comes from losing your independence. Uh, we've heard that the rate of suicide and the rate of depression has gone up since March, but it's important to point out that uh, basically depression uh, affects uh, disabled individuals to the point that it's considered the second side effect of disability. And uh, we, uh, we have to think about that that rate is actually five times higher for those individuals. And before we were really good about thinking about their physical access to the physical environment. But what happens to their access to information, right? There's actually a communication bill of rights out there that emphasizes that everyone has the right to communicate, to have a voice, and to interact socially. And for those with disability, they have the right to have access to augmentative and alternative forms, forms of communication that, come, that could come in form of assistive devices. So it just happened that this year was the pandemic, but even before this, me and my research team always had this question, how can we help individuals with upper limb disability to actually interact with computers and with smartphones? So somebody with a spinal cord injury who can't control their arm, how can they, how can they essentially swipe on a touchpad? And the statistics is actually high out there. There's about 5 million people with paralysis in the US and about 8,000 people affected annually by stroke and usually 70 to 80, uh, 50 to 70 percent of them have some sort of upper limb um, problems associated to that neurological event. The technologies that are currently out there are head gazers, which essentially tracks the location of your head, and then you can bite down on this blue portion in order to execute command. Or for example, they are gaze trackers that can actually interact with your eyes and see what, where you're looking at and execute the action accordingly. Or their voice recognitions where you can speak. But you can imagine none of these are private and they all actually require some sort of a head motion. Uh, the most popular ones actually are sip and puff, which essentially a person could either sip into this straw or pull air back from this straw and it's like an on and off switch and it can execute action or a pen that you can hold with the mouth and interact with the display all of these very interesting but they require some sort of emotion they attract unwanted attention and they're not really discreet at the research level, we see brain implants that I talked to you about. This is the Utah Electrode Array that has FDA approval, and that's a brain implant that people usually get if you hear of someone who has a brain implant, basically interacting with the brain in order to be able to execute an action and interact with the computer. We have the uh, brain gate collaboration here where two individuals actually have these Utah electrode arrays implanted to their brain. This is the processing unit and the wire attached to it. And you can see they're communicating, they're typing text and they're actually communicating with each other. This is very interesting work being done out there. And um, 
we all sat in front of our computers or TVs about a month ago and heard Elon Musk talk about revolutionizing interaction with the brain now. And that actually is very exciting to me because that means more money in that area, more advancement in that area. But essentially what they're developing, the Neuralink company is developing the link, which is essentially a compact brain implant and its processing unit that with a robotic surgery, they actually implant it into someone's brain and then it can, it can read the brain's intention and decode it. But all of this is a still work in progress and it's kind of intrusive, right? So when we were working in our lab, we were thinking of, okay, how can we enable this interaction but make it discreet and make it less intrusive? So we got an idea from this little guy here. You can see that he's using his tongue in order to swipe, right? Or to interact with um, the cell phone. And the tongue is actually a very interesting muscle because unlike other muscles in our body, the tongue doesn't go through the spinal cord. It's directly connected to your brain. So in cases of a spinal cord injury, the tongue still retains its functionality. And it occupies relatively a large portion on our cortex, similar to our fingertips, right? So that means the tongue has a lot of sensitivity that we can use to our advantage. And if you think about it, your tongue is never tired. And you can, for example, see in this video from Max Planck Institute that the tongue can, uh, can execute various different forms of action, various different movements, which is quite interesting. We can utilize that to our advantage. So we're like, okay, let's interact with the tongue. Let's use that capability in order to control external devices. Were we the first people to think of it? Not really. There's a group out there in Georgia Tech when Dr. Rovan Lu was working there that he researched on the tongue uh, drive system. It's essentially a piercing that happens on the tongue and this headset interacts magnetically with that piercing and decodes the tongue movement. This is very interesting work, um, which is actually abandoned at this point, according to my understanding. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to make a device that is discrete, that is wearable and that is wireless. No external headset, no nothing. Just something simple that interacts with your tongue. The first generation of our device was developed by Nick, who is an amazing PhD student who collaborates with us. And he basically developed this joystick that can interact via Bluetooth uh, with essentially any computer. These devices are recognized as HID, human interactable devices by any computer. So by manipulating this joystick via the tongue, we were able to see that if we wanted to type the sentence science rocks, we, we essentially take about six times the amount of time your finger would take to type that, but it's still, you had that ability. But then we wanted to move on from that position. And we wanted to develop something like the T9 keyboards then remember the first cell phones where you had to switch between the letters in order to be able to type something. So we, we mimic the same sort of setting on the device and we call it the oral user interface controller or UIC device. And we did a studies, they're all published here if you're interested. Giacomo and Nick worked together to, the, do, to do this fantastic study where they actually found that, that if we had essentially eight sites for interaction, that leads to the most effective way of communication. So we essentially assigned letters to each one of these contact pads that you can see on this retainer, which is custom made uh, and subject to specific, which is the future of variable tech making everything sub uh, subject to specific. And then uh, Sylvia, who was another student in my lab, did a, this amazing work of developing uh, the app for it. So any able body could use the device in order to use the T9 format to type. But for disabled individuals, there's a lot of study about the spacing of these keys and how they should be taken into effect and how it should communicate uh, with the technology out there. So Sylvia did this great work of developing the app for it. And then she also embedded exercises 
for increasing the tongue functionality if some functionality of the tongue is actually affected. We did a study uh, on this device and typed a pangram, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog because it includes all the letters. And on an average, basically, it's about, it takes about twice the time to type uh, than six times that we were at previously. And an experienced user, over time, they get much, much better and closer to actually typing with the speed of the hand. While all that was very cool and interesting work, uh, about a year ago, we set set out to actually make something that allows us to have continuous control over the cursor that is also adaptable to the humid environment of the mouth and can adapt to the saliva in that environment and can recognize various gestures like click, double click and whatnot. And, and Davide and Julia did an unbelievable, amazing work and developed a device that you can actually see my other student, Davide Laka, developed a model of it. So this is live model of tongue actually interacting on the surface of the device. You can see the surface of the device here, and this is the tongue swiping on the surface of the device. And you can see Veronica, who's not further developing the device, and Nick actually testing this implant. And this is Veronica's, uh, sorry, testing this wearable by just swiping their tongue on top of their palate. This is Veronica's first time and uh, typing hello using this variable and using the predictive algorithm that is available to her. And Nick is just playing this game. And this shows the functionality of our device. If you actually wanna compare it as an assistive device to technologies that are uh, basically assistive technologies that are available out there, these are, numbers of word in a minute that experienced users can type with a pen or with a sip and puff or with a tongue drive system from Georgia Tech that I mentioned. And without using predictive algorithm, we can type about 4.6 words per minute on an average. And with using predictive algorithms, we can get to 5.7. And this is not a large studies like these devices that have been out there in the market and are taking into account months of experience with these devices. So our results are pretty promising. If you actually compare this data that I just showed you to basically being able to type on a keyboard with your prominent hand, if you, if you do not use predictive text, you type about 40 words. If you, if you use predictive case, uh, pre predictive algorithm, you type about two, twice as fast. And the voice is basically the fastest form of communication. So we have a long way to go to get there, but we have shown some promising results. And we've done uh, surveys on the targeted population that we're actually interested in targeting. And 90% of them express that the discretion of our device is actually a point in adaptation for them. And 83% believe that this could bring them the independence they need to accomplish daily tasks. Uh, so basically we managed to develop something that is discrete, wireless, can interact with any computer or any smartphone without any external software requirement, is tolerant to the saliva environment in the mouth, can, uh, can give you the ability to do continuous control of the cursor, can give someone jet the ability to do various different gestures. But then we ventured out and used it as a device to actually study uh, tongue rehabilitation for speech therapy. We're collaborating with a speech therapist out there and developing softwares that can actually, for example, here I can show you that this is the model that David has still developed that shows the live motion of the tongue. So the therapist can use this as a means of giving feedback to the user about where they should move their tongue. Or for example, here, you can see pronunciation of different phonemes, how one's tongue should move and how they're actually moving their tongue. There is no tool out there currently to give feedback to the user or to the therapist as they're going through these process. 
So just to conclude, we have developed a new frontier in wearable tech, essentially a platform that you can use in order, uh, you can use it with any Bluetooth enabled device such as computers or smart prosthetics that you can control. We can use it for speech therapy. We can use it in extreme sport. Imagine having a GoPro and being able to control it with your tongue. We can use it in a, as an immersive environment in gaming and VR. We, we can use it in order to control assistive devices like smart wheelchairs. And we also can use it for human augmentations. And we're doing very exciting research in, in basically extracting vital signs from the oral cavity discreetly without attracting any unwanted attention in this hands-free board that we are moving towards. Um, thank you for your time and for your attention. If you have any questions, I have both my UIC and my Hide It variables, the startup based on the research that we have here. If you know of anyone who can take advantage of our technology, please reach out to us. Or if you would like to sponsor this work and have it come out to the people who can actually take advantage of it faster, also please let me know. I'm here for questions. Thank you so much. This has been sure. fascinating. And there have been several questions that have come in. Um, thank, you. thank you for sharing your research and all of your incredible work. We're, we're very, very grateful that you are um, a UAC graduate, but also working at UAC and researching. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, is there a big difference in technological in the technological progress of wearables that just take data, for example, a Fitbit versus wearables that help adjust functions, for example, a pacemaker or prosthetics? Uh, is there a technological difference? Was mm -hmm. that the question? Mm -hmm. So the, the sensors that they apply to it are, are very different. And the Fitbit and all those devices that you see out there, none of them actually are categorized as medical devices, or I think only Apple Watch is seeking to get that for their ECG platform uh, versus the assistive devices like pacemakers or smart uh, prosthetics go through years of extensive research and accuracy of they, they, their data that they can collect from it and the effectiveness of work is studied significantly. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, you touched a little bit upon this, but the question is, are there any wearable coronavirus detectors or maybe that are in the works right now? The Aura Ring is the most famous one. There's actually another one that is not available on the market, but it's essentially a neck band-aid type thing developed uh, by John Rogers Group from Northwestern, who's a pioneer in this field, um, that they're using it for large clinical studies. Um, if you see Chicago did this a study, that's that group. You, you hear that in the news from time to time. I imagine there's been a shift in emphasis from what people were researching before to sure. for our whole world, of course. Um, thank you. Um, another question, what power, for example, batteries will be needed for the next generation of wearables? Oh, so that's a very interesting question. So power is an extremely important limiting factor in adaptation of these variables. Even our cell phones, when they start getting old and we have to charge them all the time or our laptops, then, then we're like, oh, time to change less, right? And that's what's happening with variables. They usually do not have a very long battery life. The more functionalities they have, the shorter the battery life. But I anticipate we'll see a lot of improvement in that field as well. Hmm, interesting. Um, somebody made a comment about the probability of hacking. Is it something that we should be concerned about? I'm, I'm assuming they mean in reference to a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or something that you wear on your wrist. Um, we all have different visions and different values when it comes to privacy. Um, obviously, with any technology out there, we should be concerned about it. Right now, we were concerned about someone interrupting our Zoom call but that shouldn't stop our adaptation of the technology, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a really good analogy, yeah. Um, another question, how does the RF to the human anatomy in the mouth affect the optimization of the device? How does the it, The initials are RF, I'm not sure what RF references. If, I'm not sure exactly what they're asking, but if they're asking, 
um, how the variations in human anatomy is affecting this. That's an interesting question. That's why we have subject to specific devices. Essentially, we take very simple, very easy impressions of the mouth. There are tool, tools that they now send for people to develop at home night guards, for example. So we use the same technology, very easy. We take an impression and then make a device according to that for the individual. Uh, so that addresses all the variations. I gave this talk once and I learned that people with cliff palate who've gone through surgeries have teeth in their middle of the palate. So you can imagine how important it is to be able to custom make these devices. Thank you. Yeah, we just got some clarity that was radio frequency is what was the RF reference. Yeah, I'm not sure what they mean. I, I guess there was RF in that sense, but I'm not sure what the question means. Yeah, so if the if the person would like to clarify in chat, we can try and clarify um, a little bit more. Um, another question, though, uh, before that, uh, what are some of the roadblocks to optimizing this to more complex controls such as Alexa or Siri type of actions? So actually, there's um, we are ready for that. So let's put it that way, because any sort of device that we can interact with via Bluetooth we can connect our device to. So it's just another mode of control. So imagine a hands-free mode of control. So imagine um, if you work in a factory line where your arms are constantly engaged with heavy machinery and then you wanna have a quick stop button, for example, we can incorporate that in our device or just another means of set, um, you know, changing some settings in the device, then we can do that. Um. Yeah, it's, it's amazing technology that you've developed. It really is, um, and the yeah. adaptability of it. Uh, okay, uh, the, another question is, and I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, um, is when will this commercially be available? Good question. Um, okay. So commercially, we have, uh, we have the startup for it, but we need some help in that area to be able to address that and, uh, yeah, we need help in that area. Let me just clarify it that way. And I wish UIC had a stronger um, commercialization center that could help faculty, uh, but yeah. See. So if the help comes, it will be sooner than later. Is what Hopefully, I, heard you I mean, I gave this talk at, at an institute where actually disabled individual had attended and they were very excited about the potential of this technology. And just knowing that you can make a difference, the satisfaction that it brings to your work is just amazing. Incredible, yeah, incredible. Um, so another question, and this is a, this is a large question, um, who owns the data collected by the devices? That's a very interesting question. Um, our device doesn't really collect any data at this point, and oh, it does not. The the the. If you're using it just for the tongue trackpad, no. But if you're using it for speech therapy, for example, then it would. These are legal questions that needs to be answered later. Um, I'm an engineer. I know, right? And I know it's a very large question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so just one last sort of point is that somebody asked about what kind of help do you need? So, so there are some specifics if somebody is interested like listening to us, how do we make this available and how, um, what kind of help could they help provide? Thank you. Uh, so to be honest, me and Nick, my student that you saw that he's a PhD student at UIC, uh, we started Tidal Variables together and we have a couple of advisors, but we need, um, help in the business aspect of this startup because it's all about business in order to be able to take it into the market. We need that help and obviously financial help in order to be able to take care of the commercialization process. Um, yeah, so I would, if anyone can help us in that area, we would hugely appreciate it. Yeah, and, and I would also say including connections. And so obviously your, your information is there and we will make this uh, video available. I um, mean, certainly share your contact information. So um, thank you. Thank you so very much for this wonderful presentation and just all, again, all of your research. We're so proud that you're a graduate and that you're giving all of your, your talent to UIC and, and all of the incredible work that you're doing.
Um, very, very grateful for this discussion today. Uh, just real quick to wrap up, please join us tomorrow, uh, Thursday, October 22nd at noon Central Standard Time for a special pop-up alumni exchange program featuring expert faculty members, Kappa's David Merriman and LAS's Christopher Mooney, who are both scholars with the University of Illinois Institute of Government and Public Affairs as they present the graduated rate income tax referendum, what everyone in Illinois needs to know. Please bring your questions to this interactive discussion and get the facts before you fill out your ballot. You can find out more at go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange. And of course, be on the lookout for that short survey I mentioned at the beginning. Thank you again to uh, Professor and Ms. Bailey uh, for joining us and for this wonderful presentation. We're so grateful to you and to everybody else. Have a great day and we look forward to seeing you again in the alumni exchange. Thank you. Can I just make a comment? I see a couple of private messages to me. I'm not sure if I have enough time to get back to those people, but I see a couple of people have said that they can help us. So if you can email me, that would be amazing. So we can get in touch. I really appreciate that. Yes, please. And let me also encourage that you do sign a direct email um, because the chat we will try and capture it, but just in case we, wanna, we don't wanna miss out on any kind offers of help. So please do email directly. Um, thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thank you.